Hi, we are here at Thriving Families Chiropractic. Of course, you know Angela Flymiller and Dr. Nathan. And we wanted to address, we've had lots of uh, questions and, and really inquiries about how, why you let a fever burn, the importance of fevers, and also like how can you treat them more naturally rather than just over the counter, yeah. whatever type of medicine. Not, not to say one's good or bad, we don't want anyone to feel judged or um, right. <laughs> in any way that there's a definite one way or no other way, but yeah. we'll just get right into it, Dr. Nathan. Sure. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the biggest questions that we get in the practice is, and especially this time of year when we have moms coming in with different illnesses with their kiddos and such is, you know, what do we do with a fever? How do we approach the fever? And then also, how do we how do we calm those um, those fears as a parent? Because I, I fully get it. I'm a dad myself, right. so I, I understand that there's there's a fear behind any illness or sickness. And but the interesting thing with the fever is this: like we never we never had those fears early on. Actually, the only thing that like perpetuated those fears into fever was uh, the the branding by medications and then the stigma behind that that suddenly changed in the medical community before. Before, we actually looked at fevers in the medical community as being something super positive. We, and we go all the way back to even like Native Americans where they have these sweat lodges and they're trying to induce and create a fever response because we understood even as early as that was that the body's trying to expel something. So with fevers, um, there's, there's a lot of questions behind that and we know that some of you kind of wrote in with some of your questions so we want to maybe get right to that so we can answer those. Um, some of the biggest ones, we'll just kind of dive in with those. What, do I, I think it's important just to yeah. even say what is a fever? Okay, great. Why does yeah. your body go into it? Why fever? do we need them? Okay, perfect. Yeah, okay, let's start there. That's fine. So a fever is a vital, important process in the immune function. We a fever is not also something to be feared. The other big misconception is that a fever is caused by a virus or a bacteria. That's not true at all. In fact, the body produces the fever in order to counteract the virus or bacteria. The virus or bacteria didn't cause the fever. And in fact, in a lot of cases, research is showing that the kiddos who are coming in with fevers probably don't even have a bacterial or viral infection. And the body's just trying to expel something that may have been there for quite some time. So if we're always just chasing after that, that fever, we're approaching it wrong. But a fever is an elevated, obviously, temperature in the body. And that's important because because let's say we are worried about a virus or a bacteria, a lot of those virus or bacteria are heat liable and the fact that they will um, essentially um, not withstand the heat the body raises its temperature to. But not only that, it's kind of a call to action in the body. When the fever creates its proper responses, there are certain chemicals that arrive at the scene, if you will, and then expel whatever it is it's trying to expel. A fever is just one of that process of that, of that side of that immune system that's trying to expel something from the body, essentially. So it's a very natural, appropriate process. It's not something we should fear, actually. So the first question that we got a million times yeah. was, do we treat low-grade fevers? Right. So that's that's a really good question, and I'm going to answer that like uh, the way I, the way I would in the practice is we never treat the fever no matter what. Like we're never treating a fever, we're treating the child. So when, when a mom comes in, no matter if we're looking at a fever or whatever, what other symptomatology we're looking at, let's say the, the, the Utah cough that's going around or whatever, right? We have to look at the child, not the fever, because that's our job as parents is to boost that immune system and allow for that system to work totally appropriately. It's not to find, it's not to find what's gonna reduce this fever and what's gonna reduce this symptomatology and that symptomatology, because at that point, you're beating up the immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk about it as like Ram like you have Rambo in your body and you just you know he's going after all the bad guys if you if you administer Tylenol or something like that to, to reduce that fever response um, you just beat up Rambo and now your body's kind of stuck so what we're doing is giving things to help supplement the yes. immune system or boost the immune system so that yeah. we can continue to have a fever and fight off the infection totally yes okay. and then in my practice we're always we're definitely working with a lot of kids in the acute phase of a fever or different illnesses, but I want that mom to understand that we, we will work through this process and I want them to go through that process and learn in that process, but I want them on the other side of this to know also that what are we doing, let's say the five or six months leading up to like, let's call it the quote unquote flu season or the season where we're maybe seeing more fevers and things like that, right? Uh, what are we doing to boost that child's immune system? Not just in the moment, right then and there to get over this, but also after that and then 
we don't we don't we don't leave that illness just going okay good I'm done I'm over it but we're taking steps to make sure the immune system is working well but yes during the fever we want to make sure we are allowing the body to go through its normal responses and and fever is one of those we want to allow the body to have the right um, amount of ability for that immune system to engage well in fact in our practice when we deliver an adjustment in a kiddo who either is just coming out of a fever or has a fever we often actually see the fever spike a little bit post adjustment and that's because when we deliver an adjustment especially in the upper cervical spine that allows for the immune system to be more robust and be more appropriate and the fever is a more appropriate response. So it may, it may raise a little bit. It's not always that way, but it just may raise a little bit. So yes, we're always doing things to support the immune system, support the child during this, um, but, not, but not targeting the fever itself. Was it accurate? I, we've had this conversation before, yeah. but again, going back to like if you use something, some sort of medicine, like Tylenol, let's sure. say, yeah. to, to dull the fever, you're really just putting your good guys to sleep. Is yeah. that how, that's how you described it to me before, yeah. that I felt like it was a powerful definition for my kids to right. understand this is uncomfortable, we're gonna get through it. Yes. But um, yeah, you don't wanna put our good guys to sleep, we want them to keep fighting. Yeah, you're spot on with that. That's that Rambo, if you will, right? That's that guy who's, he's the military. He's gonna come in and knock this out, and you're spot on with that. The Tylenol is gonna go in and essentially stop Rambo from showing up to the scene. It's gonna stop the military from showing up and do what it was designed to do, which reduces the fever. Because again, the fever is the natural body's response to a fight and infection or, or expel something from the body. So yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. And we're delaying the healing time on that too. We have to understand that if we're, we're having a fever response and we give a Tylenol to the, to, the, to the kiddo or the adult, we're just prolonging that process. And the other interesting thing, kind of getting a little bit more deep into this, is we're actually ingraining that into our system, into our immune system, because the fever's job, that side of the immune system is to expel something. And then what happens with Tylenol is it actually limits the body from detoxifying. It limits the cells to detoxify through the glutathione response. And if my body cannot detoxify now, then what we've created is what I call a constipated immune system, right? So that immune system gets constipated, if you will, or can't expel something. Now you're sick. When your body can't expel something and you've trained it year after year after year to not be able to expel something, especially on a cellular level, now you start to see chronic illness and more issues down the line, more than just a fever response. So I know we'll get this question asked. So if we're trying to help the child feel comfortable and the mom yes. feels like, or the parent feels at the time that, okay, 103 is like past like their that. comfort zone. Sure. What would you recommend? Like Tylenol versus Motrin, what would you do? That's a hard question because both of those are going to be over the counter meds. I would still say, I mean, everyone's so concentrated on the number, right? The 102, the 103, the 104, the 105. Like what, what number do we intervene? What? And I will, I will never tell a mom, here's the number that you need to intervene with because it's not magic. There is no, we can look at the textbooks and say, great, but your physiology is different than my physiology. I have kiddos in the practice that go from 102 to 105 in an hour, right? That's just because their physiology is different. That doesn't mean that the infection is worse off in them. It just means that's how their physiology has reacted to it. Some big things you can do are like lukewarm baths. Right? So to support that kiddo in that moment, you don't want to do a cold bath, you don't want to do a steaming hot bath, you want to do a lukewarm bath. But, and that'll help the kiddo relax and kind of, again, support the kiddo during the fever process. What you want to make sure you don't do is when you're coming out of the bath, you want to make sure you wrap that kiddo up right away and so their, their fever doesn't either drop or accelerate too high, because then we start talking about like febrile seizures. That's typically when we'll see a febrile seizure occur, is when the fever either jumps too high too quick or too low too fast, essentially. It's not usually a number that someone reaches, it's usually a quick response response and the body's thermostat, if you will, wants to reset and that's what a febrile seizure is. We also had a lot of questions about the febrile seizures. Mm -hmm. Eva actually had one when she was 18 months old yeah. and I wasn't with Sean and Eva and it was like this traumatic experience. She, I think like, that would be traumatic. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was super traumatic. I mean, she got like a ride in the ambulance yeah. to the hospital and it was a big deal. And so Sean's always been so paranoid to make sure that that never happens again. Sure. But looking back, like, are, is it the worst thing? Yeah, great question. And obviously, I'm not going to downplay a seizure here, right? Like, right. I'm not going to be like, yeah, we should be 
go for that fever. I'll see you. Never. I've never. I've never experienced one with my kiddos. Um, I, I hope to never do so, without a doubt. But at the same time, we still have to understand that's a natural physiological process of the body, right? It's essentially the thermostat regulating itself and going, whoops, you know, I'm going too high, I'm going too low here, I need to bring this back. Um, from what we know from the research is a febrile seizure is totally different than the type of seizures or processes right. we'll see in, in like an epileptic or something like that. Um, also, maybe, I don't know your experience, but I know a lot of patients who kind of get the ride to the hospital in the, in the ambulance with their kiddo and they show up to the ER, there's not much they're actually no. going to do. They actually will probably just turn you away. Monitor, they might look at the fever, they'll probably administer Tylenol, um, but they'll, they'll, you know, they're not gonna, there's not gonna, they're not gonna take you in for the night or something like that. Unless they found some irregularities in your heart or brain activity, they're just going to just turn you away. Yeah. Is that what happened with you? Yeah, they monitored for like a few hours yeah. and then we went home. Yeah. But looking back, she, it was like summertime, she was really hot and we didn't know she was sick and she had totally. a fever and then she was like, or maybe it wasn't, I don't know. But anyway, she got wrapped in a blanket. So yeah. it was kind of like just spiked things and I totally. think she went exactly what you described. She yeah. Like went from a okay and then just something happened and went spiked more, so. Yeah, yeah so that's why you have to be careful of this. What would you say to just going along the lines of ways that you can support their body yeah. as they're fighting these fevers? Yeah. I know one thing, like you said, is it's what we're doing before they get sick and what we're doing after they get sick. Yeah. I know our regimen in our home has kind of changed in, in boosting the immune system every day. What do yeah. you recommend yeah. that parents can do to, to boost to that immune system? Kids? Yeah, immune without systems. a doubt. Like, just like you said, I always harp on that. I'm going to take a moment to harp on that again, is make sure you're being so proactive in this response. Right. Don't be reactive. I mean, in the moment, yes, with an acute illness, we, we are inevitably going to be reactive to a point, but we need to make sure throughout the year we're being proactive. Some big things, especially this time of year, to help boost the immune system. I look at probably three really big ones that are just simple and easy for kiddos to, to work with, or even adults, is uh, we can boost up vitamin C in this process. And there's different kinds of vitamin C. And with kiddos, like um, we would we would suggest typically like on a, on a whole food vitamin C. That's what I would pr work with a kiddo with, um, not like your your ascorbic acid. So not like your Walgreens ascorbic acid. Let's let's do something a little more bioavailable. So you do a whole food vitamin C. If we've got a, even a, a you know a one that's a little bit younger, we can buffer that with a sodium ascorbate. Um, so there's different types of vitamin C we can utilize to help the system be more regulated. Um, and then we have, without a doubt, elderberry, which is great, awesome for fighting off um, viruses. Uh, there's some great studies that show elderberry is fantastic for fighting off viruses. I think that's on the growing trend. Lots of people have been talking yeah. about yeah, elderberry. Yeah, right? it's, 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 it's kind of funny because it's always been there for so long, but it's just kind of like one of those forgotten things for a while, mm -hmm. and then it kind of comes back and people are getting more on board with it. And then, as, especially as a pediatric and family chiropractor, we're concerned with making sure that neurology is integrating and functioning well, because that nervous system is what coordinates and communicates the proper immune response. So just like we talked about a minute ago, if I deliver an adjustment in this area, we can get a proper immune response and see the fever spike, or you know, not spike, but grow up a little bit, a couple degrees. Uh, we want that immune system to be more robust at all points in time. So we wanna make sure kiddos are being checked um, from, from day one on to make sure their neurology is communicating well too. So those are probably the three biggest things you could do really easy for you. Awesome. Um, we also had a few moms ask with their kids on the spectrum, um, if fevers, if they work through a high fever, they've heard that sometimes they can see cognitive function yeah. increase. Right. What do we know about that? Yeah, so there's there's a lot of there's some research out there. There's a lot of research on fevers that is not talked about quite often, but um, there's some research out there that shows every time a kiddo, especially a kiddo, because they have way more ability to go through what we call neuroplasticity and, and growth processes and leaps neurologically, is that after a fever process, the kiddo can actually take a neurological leap, if you will, or a cognitive leap. And, and growth. So there's what, I don't know enough to say, yeah, this is the process that happens. I just know there are studies showing that that actually could be a potential, that we could grow a little bit through a fever process, but if we're stunting that process through other remedies, then, then, then we're not able to do that. Um, Dr. Pelveski is a great pediatrician on the East Coast who has some of this research um, that he talks about. 
um, when it comes to the growth after um, a fever response. And one of the other questions was mentioned, I wanna make sure we approach this too, is what are some natural things we can do to reduce a fever? Right. So again, I wouldn't reduce it naturally either. I would just support the body and support the immune system. That's probably a big question I get in my practice is, okay, we're not gonna do Tylenol, we're not gonna do this, but how can I get the fever to come down naturally? And I'm like, well, we still don't wanna do that. We still, we still wanna let the fever do what it's designed to do. Whether you do it from a natural standpoint or not, you wanna make sure you're still just supporting the fever. Can we talk to just, let's say, I mean, cause we're pretty new to this. Yeah. For, for years, I didn't know anything different. So right. I would give the kids Tylenol or ibuprofen if it yeah. was just miserable for them. Right. And I've looked at it now and I say, okay, what can I do? Oh, guys. I'm pregnant. I just lost my question. I just had a ton of plate. Okay. What was it? Well, okay, I know a lot of back. people are also asking, oh. how long do we let the yes. fever last? Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Yes. So let's let's approach one of the biggest myths behind fevers, and then we'll dive into that too. Is like fevers will cause brain damage at a certain degree, or if we leave them for too long. There's actually no evidence of a bacterial or viral infection causing a fever and then leading to brain damage. There's there's never been a case, and you can actually go to the Mayo Clinic website. And it mentions that. So this isn't like... Which, this is hard to take. Cause totally. Because all of my life, I've yes. been told like, you can't let right. it get too high because then they're way worse. Yes. For so longer than three days, they need right. to see a doctor. Right. right. And there's, there's what... Well, let's let's come back to the longer than three days thing in just a minute. But just understand when we get to like those 107, 108 temperatures, that's typically like give you for example, if we left it, if a kid was left in a car or something like that, will that cause brain damage? Sure, but that's an external force. See, the body regulates. It's amazing. It's never going to go after and kill itself. The other interesting thing is this: the viruses they actually need the host to survive too. So they're actually not out to kill the person either. They're actually there to survive as well. Mm -hmm. So everyone's trying to like live in this homeostatic range and it's just not working. But essentially, um, there's, not a, there's, there's not a temperature that has been reached in, a, in an infectious fever to lead to brain damage that, that we are aware of that research shows. So the other, the other question is, how many days until we seek care or something like that? And that's, and that's a little tricky because there's certain illnesses that we want to pay close attention to. Let's look at pneumonia just real quick here. Mm -hmm. Pneumonia has this real telltale sign of like a pretty decent fever, you know, some congestion and respiratory distress, and then a lot of that kind of goes away, and then it comes back with like a vengeance, super high fever. That's like a telltale sign for pneumonia. That's something you definitely want to make sure we're getting kiddos to the doctor ASAP to get a chest, chest x-ray, see if there's pneumonia they're battling or something like that. But the amount of days that a kiddo has a fever, it's there is no set time. I mean, if you're if 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 we're talking about an infant here, you know, under six months, um, the time frame before where that becomes really dangerous and not very dangerous is smaller. So having an infant checked out sooner would definitely be advised without a doubt. But when we start getting to higher up toddler school aged years and we see a fever lasting for a couple days like that, I'm still supporting the immune system at that point. My job is not to reduce that fever. If we have a fever lasting for a very long time and your mom gut and your mom intuition say, I need to get this checked out, obviously get it checked out. I'm not telling you not to have a fever or not to have an illness checked out. I'm just saying, in, in the moment we need to support the immune system mm -hmm. rather than telling it to shut up and go away because now we've created a whole other mess of issues. Okay, so once again, to make it clear, I'm yeah. a first time mom trying sure. this out, letting the fever burn in my child. Yeah. What do I do or how many days? I know you can't say exactly, but yeah. what's the goal here to so I can feel comfortable mm -hmm. to get through this? Yeah, and it's, it's hard because it's case by case. Like whenever a kiddo comes in to my practice and, and mom says, you know, they've had a fever for X amount of days. Well, we're gonna look at other symptomatology. We're not just gonna look at the fever. Again, we're kind of hyper-focused on that. Right. We're gonna say, you know, were they listless? Were they maybe more lethargic? What was going on? I mean, how are they, are they, are they able to cognitively get around the house? You know, those mm -hmm. other symptomatology. Are they vomiting? Are they, are they having other issues with keeping water into their system? Are they totally dehydrated? This matters way more. Okay than just what's the fever doing, how long has it been there? Mm -hmm. So again, looking at the child, treating the child, not the fever, right? We have to take into account how the body is actually functioning, how the immune system is engaging. So there is no, there is no here's a fever, here's the guidelines, here's what you do. It's, it's, it sounds great on paper, and of course you could run that way, 
but you might be spending a lot of extra money just running and running to the doctor's office for no reason. So if you're seeing simple, maybe even small, slight changes for the better, yeah. you can keep writing this out. Can you kind of walk us through as a parent, if you see these positive signs as your child's sick, but these are positive signs, you know yeah. that their body's fighting, it's going in the right direction. Sure. You can calm your mommy nerves. Sure. What are some of those things to look well, for? I mean, fever is one. I'm calm when my kiddos have a fever. Mm -hmm. That means their body's doing what it's designed to do. Oftentimes I ask patients like, if you're if you're vomiting, are you sick, are you well? It's kind of like a dumb question, but it makes you think for a minute, right? And a lot of patients will go, well, if I'm vomiting, I'm sick. Well, no, you're not. You're actually well. Think about if your body needed to vomit and you couldn't, now you're sick. Same thing with the fever. If my kiddos have a fever, I know their immune system is engaging. I know what's happening. So actually the fever is one of those signs, okay? okay? Um, but progressing through an illness like that, of course we're gonna look at symptomatology, without a doubt. I mean, it kind of goes back to what we just talked about is maybe maybe the first two days they're, they're laid up on the bed or the couch and they're not moving very well. They're not taking a lot of water in. And, and that's another big thing is we, we tend to be so hyper-focused on like, we want you to eat, we want you to eat. And that gets scary, right? Because we're obviously, we understand that the body needs food, but okay. at that point in time, we should actually be pushing liquids. The digestive system actually shuts down during an illness. It's supposed to. That's designed appropriately to do so. So every time we give that child like more food, especially it's like something that's more fibrous or something like that, you might see an improper response. You might be hindering the immune response or the digestive system at that point. So if you see a kiddo that maybe was laid up and now they're doing better, they're up and moving, they're able to drink and eat more, these are some really positive signs for a breastfeeding baby. You know, that that's always a hard one because, right. right, you don't have a lot of options. You want to make sure they stay hydrated without a doubt. Um, so if you start seeing the latch to get a little bit better, they're not pulling off as much. They're wanting to come to the breast more often. It's another thing, skin to skin on these little ones. Let's, let's be promoting that more often than Tylenol. Skin to skin mm -hmm. has been proven to actually balance out those body temperatures way more than, and in, in, way more in a healthy way than Tylenol ever will. Fascinating. That's so interesting. I never heard about that with a fever. Yeah. That's cool. With without skin to skin. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. We, we practice that in our house without a doubt. Okay. Well, I feel like this is, this is one of those things for those who have been like, okay, I'm going to try it the next time my kid gets sick. Yeah. Like there's some positive steps, things you can do to mm -hmm. just kind of reduce our anxiety and really let our bodies. I think the other thing that I appreciate that we've had discussions about too, is by letting your body do what it should do, by yes. letting the fever burn, the end result are even stronger after, oh, which to me, I feel like has been a powerful motivator to like, yes. okay, let this yeah. be uncomfortable. Yes. We're all okay. We can get through it. Right. And it's not fun in the moment. Not yeah. It's not fun in the moment. Uh, but kids are supposed to get sick and get over it. And, and that's that's a part of building a healthy immune response. And and you know, kiddos who it worries me when someone comes in like my kiddos are never sick. And I'm like, <laughs> I well, wish I could say that. Right. <laughs> but it, it would be nice, but that's not how life and physiology and no, immune systems are right. built. And like, it would be cool, but it's just not. This is not how it works. So with. With kiddos and, and getting sick, it needs to happen. It's an appropriate process. As parents, we need to be there and support that, but we need to have the knowledge to do so and not be guided by fear so much. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for your time, Dr. Nathan. Yeah, thanks. Else oh, no, I think we covered here? a lot. Okay. Good discussion. I hope that it's awesome. a helpful one. Yeah.